I do have a brief introduction, so we, it gives them a little bit of time to. Okay, to so join. my my brief introduction is welcome once again to ECE 200. This is our undergraduate seminar series, and uh, every week we'll have uh, one presentation. Uh, oftentimes, it's uh, our old graduates. Uh, visiting us from whatever company that they're working in and tell us their experiences and advertise their companies. Uh, sometimes uh, it's uh, seminars like this, so, some campus resources uh, introduced here. And we have, we did this about two years ago and I'm looking forward for this one. And uh, we also bring our own uh, faculty members, um, recent, uh, recent ones who have joined us to, to tell the students about their research and what they teach and so forth. So it's gonna be a mix like this as usual. And towards the end of the semester, uh, these uh, external presentation stops and uh, for uh, three or four sessions, the students will be presenting their uh, senior research uh, and thesis results. So it's, it's a undergraduate research symposium. That, that's how the semester ends. So that, that's the format. So uh, all the students, welcome uh, to this uh, instance of ECE 200. And uh, you should be paying attention to all these uh, seminars that will be presented for you. And tell us towards the end of the semester in a writing assignment, which presentation you found most helpful. And also the writing assignment will ask you to identify which uh, undergraduate research symposium presentation, the 10 minute talk given by some student, you like the best and the reasons for it. So attending these uh, uh, lectures and, and writing um, this particular uh, assignment towards the end of the semester, that's what we are expecting from you. And uh, many of you are in different time zones, so you don't have to show up all the time, but at least you should be showing up some of the time. These are going to be recorded. Even the ones you miss, you can watch. So that, that's very nice. But also you should be participating and asking questions to our speakers. It's, it's very boring if a speaker speaks, speaks, speaks and no student or nobody from the audience asks anything. So I'm hoping that you will have plenty of questions to our guests over here. So with that, uh, let me um, give the podium to you, Jennifer, and you may start. However All right, you want to great. start, do we have the other members of the panel arriving already? Um, it looks like they're having a little bit of issues joining, but I connected them with Catherine to help them okay, uh, so maybe it's a, get on board it's and URL and get logged or password in. or whatever issue. Yeah, I'm not sure if they, they may have been trying to join without having logged in. So um, hopefully- But we can Catherine still start. Can... Since Craig is here, uh, you have plenty mm -hmm. to say. Let's get going. Yes, of course. Um, so uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jenny Kim. I am the Assistant Director of Talent at the Research Park. And my main role is to help the companies in the Research Park to connect with students like you. And then um, on the flip side, make sure that all of you understand and know what Research Park is and all of the different opportunities that are available there. Um, so I'm going to share a couple of slides and um, just provide a really quick overview for those um, who aren't as familiar with Research Park or kind of hearing about it um, for the first time. So um, uh, Research Park is a technology hub that is right here on campus. It helps to cultivate startups and accelerate corporate innovation. So there are actually um, over uh, 120 companies at uh, that range from small startups to large corporations. They hire freshmen to PhD, uh, domestic and international students. They, um, they also, they hire based on skill and experience more than just majors um, because they, they typically do hire from all across campus, um, all majors and colleges. These are all paid internships. So these are great opportunities. Um, because they're right here on campus, they're able to uh, offer internships all year round. So part-time during the school year, so you can be taking classes and doing uh, a professional internship, as well as full-time in the summer. Now, when we are on site, it is very easy to be accessible by bus, bike, and there's free parking available. Right now, most of the um, internships are 
virtual, um, kind of uh, in a hybrid situation, uh, just like uh, your classes are. There are a few companies that are on site, which actually two of the companies that you're going to hear from today are on site. Um, and, you know, they've been able to take advantage of the fact that um, the university is doing so much testing. So they're actually also using the um, the uh, the app that you guys um, are are using to get into buildings and stuff. So um, I want to encourage you to, um, I'm going to put this into the chat here, but we do have a student newsletter. So feel free to subscribe to that newsletter. I just put the link in the chat, um, as well as checking out the Research Park job board to see what all of these different opportunities are that are available to you. Um, I also wanted to plug on March 2nd, we will be having our 2021 Spring Research Park Career Fair. This will be virtual through Zoom. Um, it is going to be from 3 to 7 p.m. If you want more information, please check out our website and I can put that link into the chat again, um, I'll, or I'll put that into the chat after this. And we do have currently two sponsors, um, PNG Smart Lab and Motorola Solutions, who are going to be uh, sponsoring that along um, with the Research Park. This career fair is exclusive to Research Park companies. So if you're specifically interested in working for a Research Park company, this is a great opportunity. There are a lot of opportunities um, and internships for the spring as well as the summer. And some of the companies are already um, Pro, uh, promoting their fall internship opportunities. So please be sure to check that out. It's a really good chance to connect with all sorts of different companies. They're doing really cool things. And I'm gonna let the companies, um, company representatives that are here um, share about what they're doing. So um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. And please feel free to ask questions in the chat along the way. I do have questions prepared, um, but I will go ahead and ask your questions along the way. But at the end, we will also make sure to, to leave time for um, you all to ask questions of our speakers. Um, so it looks like we have everybody here. Sorry about the confusion with the personal accounts and uh, things like that. Um, but we have with us today, Craig Ibbotson from Motorola Solutions, Brad Miller from PNG Smart Lab, and Laura Syme from Access Capital. I am going to let them introduce themselves further to provide a brief overview of what their operations in the research park are doing, um, along with what their titles are, what their role is. And um, I'm going to ask that uh, each speaker, each panelist also describe kind of what is the difference between what you might be known for or what, you know, overall the company does versus kind of what you're doing here in um, the research park location. So let's go ahead and start with Craig. Good evening, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, my name is Craig Ibbotson. I'm the research director of our facility here at, Motor at Motorola Solutions at Research Park. Um, right now, we have about 44 students uh, working for us here as interns. I'm a U of I alum. I graduated in computer science from the College of Engineering. So I'm very, you know, being on campus is like a dream come true to me. And actually being able to work with incredibly smart people and incredible talent like all of you it makes uh, every day fun to be here. And I know Brad and Laura feel the same. You know, I think when uh, Jenny asks, I guess one thing, we are, we're not the cell phone company. It's how I always start. We're Motorola Solutions. We're all about mission critical voice, mission critical video, mission critical analytics. Think first responders. We, res we have a whole portfolio of solutions for first responders. Everything from the radio that they use to uh, we do all the, when you call 911, it's our software that actually routes 911 almost in every case as efficiently as possible. A whole suite of cloud-based applications that support them. Um, everything from video analytics over body cameras, car cameras, and fixed cameras, and then uh, analytics over all of that. So 
And cybersecurity is a, is a big part of what we do as well. One of the advantages I like for us here at um, Research Park is, you know, if you think about all these different things we do, mobile development, cloud computing, real-time embedded software, we actually take projects from all over the corporation. So we actually have a little bit of everything, uh, which is great. And, and at, at our core, we are a high-tech software company. That's what we do. Um, and we cover, we use all the latest uh, methodologies and processes, and I'll be glad to talk about those more. But in a nutshell, that's where we are, and glad to be here tonight. Jenny, you're Jenny, please muted. unmute. Yes, sorry. <laughs> Brad, um, if you could go next. Hi, I'm Brad Miller from Procter & Gamble. I lead our Procter & Gamble Smart Lab, PNG Smart Lab here on campus at the University of Illinois. I saw the weather today and unlike Craig said, I'm gonna stay home today, uh, but I am typically in the office uh, like Craig is and actually he and I share an office. Uh, we share the same building. Laura, you're in the same building as us too, aren't you? Yeah, we're all in yeah, the same I'm, building. I'm Craig's neighbor, but- She's I'm my neighbor, right. yeah. <laughs> Uh, so what it makes us different from the regular Procter & Gamble. So Procter & Gamble is a consumer products goods company. We are responsible for the manufacture and sale of a number of brands that many of you know and recognize, things like Pantene Pro-V, Head & Shoulders, Pampers, Mr. Clean, Swiffer, Tide, Gain, Always, uh, and everything in between, Bounty, Puffs, and Charmin. There's a lot of different products that you might see in your home, use on a regular basis. Those are Procter & Gamble products. Uh, the p g Smart Lab is slightly different in that we are responsible for managing research for the company. And we specifically manage research using smart technologies. The buzzword is IoT, uh, but these are embedded systems and looking at using embedded systems to be able to understand consumer behavior in their home particularly as it relates to the consumption of and use of our different products. So we are able to uh, prototype, develop, and deploy those systems into consumers' homes. We pay them for participation in our research. And then we capture, use, and analyze that data to drive business insights. And that's what we are here at the P&G Smart Lab. Great, thank you, Brad and Laura. All right, so um, I'm probably the least household name out of the three companies we have on the panel. And part of that is my industry and part of that is my company. So my name's Laura Syme. I'm from Axis Capital. Axis is an insurance and reinsurance company. Um, and part of the reason that Axis is in Research Park at University of Illinois is because not a lot of people go to college thinking about insurance as a career path. Um, I am also not actually a U of I graduate, although my dad and a lot of people in my family went to U of I. So there's like a funny small world story about how I ended up here, but I really love it here. Um, and, you know, Axis is a big global company. And so it is always a very interesting conversation about, you know, how did we end up having an office in central Illinois of all places when a lot of my colleagues are in Zurich and London and New York. Um, in Alpharetta, Georgia. But, you know, we really found that the student talent here is that unique and that talented, that it's worthwhile to have a relationship with the University of Illinois and our research park office is the gateway um, to yeah. that relationship. In our site, we have about, you know, 12 to 16 interns and I have five full-time employees as well that help me balance projects and share that um, work in an interface with the university. Perfect, thank you. Um, so I thought we could start out uh, maybe getting the students excited if you could share about some breakthroughs that have come out of the work done at the research park and maybe start with Craig. Sure. Um, we do a lot of interesting projects here. I, actually, I think there's two projects I thought of that I think are really are really groundbreaking. One of the biggest, you know, again, I t said we're all about public safety. One of the biggest issues in public safety today is when the person calling 911 speaks a different language than the call taker. 
Um, one of the biggest problems today with um, language translation is detecting what language it is. Uh, you know, it's easy once you know what language it is to do automatic translation. And it's, it's easy also if you're doing text, right? If you're doing text messages, but doing it with audio is extremely difficult and there's actually no solution to that. So um, we have a, a couple PhD students and we've been working with um, some people in the university. And what we've actually been able to do at this point is actually build a solution and let me just get a little context to this. When you call 911, the operator is federally guided that they have a maximum of 64 seconds from the time they get the call to actually determine what the issue is and what kind of uh, help you need and then turn that over to a dispatcher who has 60 seconds to make sure that the unit actually gets dispatched. If it's an, if it's an ambulance, the right one. So a total of two minutes and four seconds from the time they answer that's the allocation that they're given by the government to actually have a proper response to your house. When somebody calls and doesn't speak the language, it actually, it, it turns into 20, 30 minutes sometimes before they can send a response. So, I mean, they estimate right now 10,000 lives a year are lost because of this language translation barrier. So not to belabor the point, it's a big issue and at this point now, we've actually developed a solution, the students here in conjunction with some work that's been going on at the university, we can actually identify, properly identify the language now in 20 seconds or less with 95% accuracy in terms of that. And that includes different dialects of Chinese, um, different Middle Eastern languages, being able to detect between Russian, Thai and other. So it's really been extraordinary. And as we work to deploy this, I mean, the impact is gonna be incredible. Um, so I would say for us, that's an example of, that's one of the premier projects. We do a lot with computer vision too. Uh, and so some of the work that our students have been doing on computer vision have really made incredible strides. And we have a portfolio that allows us to tie communications and, and computer vision. So, you know, if you detect a gun, somebody has a gun in a school, it'll automatically ring the resource officer's phone and being able to take large quantities of data and do what they call loose object tagging uh, and has really made a big difference in that. And those are actually things that were developed here at Research Park. Great, thank you. Um, Brad? Yeah, I can't top that. Sorry. <laughs> that's really cool. Um, you know, we're not saving lives. I wish we could say that we were, but no, that's, that's absolutely amazing, Craig. I, I knew that you guys were having an impact, but I didn't realize it was that, that important. Uh, so really, Good on you for doing that. Uh, the, the most exciting projects that are coming out of our office are largely the interest that is being generated inside the company. At CES this last year, uh, so two, was it last week, two weeks ago? Uh, I'm losing track of time now, but at CES, the big push was largely on using artificial intelligence machine learning to be able to improve the quality of sustainability in people's homes. So the most exciting initiative that's coming out of our office is what we call 50 Leader Home. You can look it up, 50leaderhome.org, where we are working to understand what consumption of water and energy looks like inside people's homes, primarily to be able to make sustainable irresistible so that we can help consumers understand that using the typical household, at least in the United States, uses approximately 500 liters of water a day. And there are many cities in the United States, particularly Los Angeles, New York, and others that are really quickly approaching day zero in which they run out of usable potable water. And there are a lot of questions that we're trying to answer, particularly around the water usage space. Uh, namely, why are we flushing water, fl flushing toilets with drinkable water? Uh, are there other partnerships and other things that we can do to limit the amount of water that is being used and at the same time, increase, at least maintain it at parity, if not improve the quality of the experience, the user experience in the home. Because we can reduce the amount of water that we're using in each of our homes, but that doesn't make it a pleasurable experience, right? Wash that you're flushing our toilets with a bucket is not the same thing as flushing it by pushing the little handle. And so making sure that we can make sustainable irresistible is a part of what our office is doing by understanding consumer habits and practices, understanding what people are doing inside their homes so that we can then drive forward in action, both in product formulation, in new product development or other things that might be available 
partnerships with utility companies, partnerships with other companies like Kohler and so on, to be able to improve the quality of sustainability inside consumers' homes. And that's not just here in the United States, that's globally. Great, very cool. And Laura. So insurance being the industry that it is, um, I have to fight a little harder to, uh, you know, take the second degree impacts of my business, but insurance being the business of transferring risk, um, you know, there is a societal purpose to what insurance does and, you know, how it makes people's lives better. It's supposed to um, give people the confidence to take risk in their day-to-day -day lives. There's a tangential purpose to that. And, you know, the work that we do here at the research center within AXIS is recognized in terms of tool building, um, process enhancements. Um, some of the infrastructure and tools that we have built here are being used throughout the company and have like substantial time savings. Um, AXIS as a company has done a lot of corporate philanthropy. Um, we've done some climate change research. There was actually recently a press release where we had a collaboration with a University of Illinois professor the Brookings Institute and some internal folks at AXIS um, to put together a paper about uh, climate change research and uh, uh, city infrastructure in specifically in Miami and how that's going to respond to climate change and flood. Um, so that is sort of an example of like, you know, how we're using university resources and how we're using sort of our site as sort of a launching pad for um, some of that research. All right, great, thank you. Um, so as you can see, the companies in the research park, they're all working on all sorts of different projects having uh, impact and you know, the students are working to on these projects directly. And so a lot of really cool things for uh, you students, the students get to work on. Um, I was hoping that you could maybe talk a little bit more about maybe what the day-to-day -day might look like and what an ECE or CS student can kind of look forward to working on, like how are they contributing to these projects? And we'll just kind of keep the same rhythm if we can start with Craig. Is it, I don't want to make sure I'm monopolized going first. If you, if you want to change it up, it's fine. Um, I'll start and then, yeah, that's fine. So the day-to-day, -day, I guess there's a couple things to that question, Jenny. One, one is, um, you know, I think, all of us will tell you that your academic pursuit is is number one, right? We want you to succeed academically. So we work around your academic schedule during the school year. I kind of, my view is kind of, uh, you know, it's like 10 to 15 hours a week. And I think of that as like 160 to 240 hours a semester. And, you know, if you have midterms one week and you're not able to work, that's fine. You know, we'll make it up a week when you have more time available. So I think flexibility is really big in terms of the day to day. I'm really big on, you know, all of us, you know, um, I like being in the office. I think it's great to have that touch point. We're really big on, I think we, you know, all of us take pride in the offices that we have here. Uh, and we do a lot, try to do a lot. So, I mean, you know, there's a good sense of community. The day-to-day -day, then let's, are things like that. Um, as far as, you know, the type of work that you would do, especially as somebody in one of the engineering disciplines that Jenny mentioned, you know, uh, for us, as I mentioned before, we're primarily a software company. We do have some electrical engineering and mechanical engineering, but we don't really do that here. Um, you know, we have teams that you'd be maybe remote working with, but generally for us, it's cloud computing, real-time embedded software, mobile application development. Um, we do a lot of cybersecurity. We're doing a large cybersecurity project now, analytics. And then a big thing, which I don't think they do a really good job of teaching at the university, no offense, is just um, DevOps, which is how do you actually, this automated delivery of software, you know, how do you actually take your software and actually do that last mile out to the customer where you're continuous, you're doing continuous delivery. So that's another big thing for us. And we're an agile shop. So one of the things you'll learn here, if you come work here, is how to develop software in an agile way using the concept of scrum and sprints and things like that. So that in a nutshell, that's what we do here at Motorola Solutions. Great, Brad? So our day-to-day -day is very similar to Craig's. Um, we, I like going into the office as well, but more importantly, we actually run the operations for a lot of our research. And so we physically have to be in the office quite significantly. 
Uh, when COVID hit back in March of last year, when all of the shut stay at home orders came into place, we went home for about a month and realized that we couldn't afford to keep staying at home, that we needed to continue running the operations of our research. And so we've actually been in the office uh, this whole time from, from April on. Uh, so the day to day, it's a very safe environment. And I know that Craig's office is exactly the same way, but a very safe environment. We have actually, uh, a, we have a biosafety lab inside of our office because we do, like I said, deploy embedded systems into consumers' homes. And when those come back from consumers' homes, they need to be cleaned. And so our biosafety lab includes the space or is the space where we can actually uh, bring these devices, clean them, make sure that they are operational. So there's kind of a lot of different moving parts that come with operationalizing this research. Uh, if you're thinking about uh, potentially applying for and working with me, you could potentially jump into one of two camps. One is our data science camp, and there's a lot more than just data science. Uh, and the other one is our systems or our sensors camp, what I call our sensors camp. And there's a lot more than just embedded systems. Uh, really what it is, is it looks like firmware updates, it, it systems, it looks for the sensors at least, it looks like firmware updates, it looks like retrofitting and refurbishing, it looks like soldering, it looks like actually taking a PCB apart, asking the questions that need to be resolved on that, making sure that it's communicating appropriately with the cloud, with whatever cloud provider, which whatever communication protocol we're using, be that BLE, Wi-Fi, or some form of mesh, right? Like there are different solutions that we have with our sensors out there. And we're trying to figure out the best way for them to communicate and making sure that they do communicate so that we can deploy them into the right study. Uh, it, it includes provisioning a lot of the sensors that we're using. So making sure that they are assigned to a particular household while maintaining the privacy of that household so that we're not actually collecting personally identifiable information and we're not exposing personally identifiable information, but rather we're keeping everything safe and secure. On the data science side of things, there's a lot of different questions that we're trying to resolve. Um, I, th I think that Laura and Craig are going to feel the same way, but the work that we do here is very much needed inside the business. Uh, and I often am I tell my interns, if you don't do it, I have to, because someone's got to do it. This is real time business analytics that we're doing for the, for our business. And, and so we need to continue operating. And if there are problems, if uh, a Jupyter notebook, for example, doesn't run, we have to troubleshoot why doesn't it run. If it's not working, if the workflow, the data flow is not actually functioning, we have to figure out why not. If the data doesn't look right, if that gut sent, that gut check of the data is like, hey, you know what, that number doesn't look right, we have to troubleshoot and ask, is that actually what it is? Right, and so it's diving through raw telemetric data and asking the questions of how should this look and then it's visualizing that data. So there's a lot of different moving parts and pieces on both of these sides. Um, there's, there's asset tracking. We have to maintain a fleet of several hundred sensors uh, in different households and making sure that they're functioning and right battery levels and things. There's a lot of hands-on work that we're doing. Um, the thing that I like most about what we do here is that I don't know of any other company globally that's doing the same things that we are doing. And that's a lot of fun. That's a lot of exciting. It's a lot of exciting areas and pardon, pardon my three year old who says she needs me right now. Uh, but that it's, it's a lot of fun. And uh, just to kind of put a pitch out there, Jenny, if, if that's okay, I'm looking for five interns over the next two weeks. I need to hire quickly. So if anyone's interested, come talk to me. <laughs> All right, good to know. And Laura. Yeah, so um, from the insurance and reinsurance side, um, our day-to-day -day has a little bit of flavors of some of the things that both uh, Brad and Craig mentioned. Um, you know, Axis as a development shop, we, we do Agile and Scrum, although that's not something that I have strictly enforced on our interns here. Um, my development and research shop doesn't officially sit under our IT like organizational structure, but we work in partnership with them um, so that our interns are learning like how to properly prototype and develop things so that the tools that we can develop can someday end up in our production environments, you know, with the proper securities, with the proper architecture, all of those things. Um, insurance as an industry is full of data. There are tons of opportunities to do really cool data and analytics work 
and to help um, our decision makers uh, make better decisions and do better analytics with the information that we've been stockpiling. Access as a company has been around for almost 20 years. Um, but a lot of times there just either isn't time or isn't necessarily the, the most recent knowledge to be able to access that data in a way that is, you know, insightful. And so that is a place where, you know, we find you students are one of the best resources. Um, and getting you guys in, helping us with our tools, our processes, robotic process automation and um, API development are sort of two areas that um, I'd really like to focus on this year. We have a lot of processes that, you know, maybe take too many clicks. Um, I promise pretty much all of the interns that I interview, if I don't show you a really horrible Excel spreadsheet at least once, I really haven't shown you the insurance industry. Um, that's just part of the game. Um, there's lots of opportunities to come in and, you know, bring new insights and new ways of doing things. And Axis being a smaller company um, has the agility to implement and accept those changes. Um, so the people at Axis are a great resource. There's opportunities to work with project sponsors from around the world. We had a CS student last fall um, who worked with a project sponsor out of Zurich. Um, she built a prototype that was, um, we, you know, came into the project thinking this isn't really something that, you know, we can promise as a real deliverable. It's kind of a blue sky dream to get it done, but we were able to deliver something that is now in production and it's being used by, you know, over 50 people in the organization, which is, you know, a really cool outcome for a single student project working with a sponsor. Um, most of my students work in like singles or pairs um, on projects. It just sort of depends on the type of work. Um, but there's lots of opportunities to sort of rotate around and work on different things. Even in my role as the site lead, that's one of the things I enjoy most about Axis is I don't necessarily know what I'm gonna work on today. Um, and it's, you know, a little bit of a surprise. So that's what I enjoy. Laura, I'm going to steal Great. that because I, I love the <laughs> nasty Excel spreadsheets that I look at. I mean, I had a call earlier this morning with a nasty Excel spreadsheet and one of my data science interns was looking at it and he's like, yeah, this is bad. Like, yeah. I, I don't I don't know why it was put in that raw format, but this is really bad. <laughs> and I mean if you can come in, if you find that you have a knack or an enjoyment for coming in, learning about that Excel spreadsheet, and then turning it into, if you turn it into Python or C Sharp, or I don't, I don't really care what you turn it into, but if you make that working through that sheet and that process, understanding why it is or was the way it is, and then making it better, if you're good at that, that is an incredible skill set. Please come work for me. Yeah, real impact. That oh, everyone's talking to me here about real impact. Um, so that's really great, uh, Laura. You kind of touched on this a little bit, but if you could maybe expand, um, give a little bit more. If we could hear a little bit more detail about what the intern team looks like. So do you hire undergrad, grad, both international students? Um, kind of size of the team. Yeah, all of the above. I have um, 12 to 16 interns at a time um, I'm hiring. I think I need to go back and look at my numbers, but probably about um, six plus interns for the spring or summer. Um, I have um, only two job profiles posted on Handshake, but I hire more than that. Um, I sort out the numbers later. Insurance, I should mention too, is you know an industry where and you know, I hope no one takes offense to this, but what you major, major in doesn't matter so much as what you're willing to learn. Um, you know, I kind of mentioned nobody, except for maybe actuaries, go to school thinking about working in insurance. I majored in meteorology and weather. Um, you know, I have colleagues who have majored in all kinds of different things, including like PhDs in physics, PhDs in you know, all kinds of things, bachelors, people with only high school diplomas. Um, who are very intelligent people and who have tons of business knowledge. Um, there's so much to learn on the job and that's something that um, all of my students get. 
is there, there's a lot of on the job learning and there's a lot to, to be picked up as a student. And so, yes, I hire undergrads, grad students, um, CPT and OPT is fine. Um, as long as you can get that through your department, that's, that's fine by me. And similar to Craig, I think, you know, 10 to 15 hours is my like minimum recommended hours. If you have a week where, you know, you can't work, communication is super important to me. So just let me know that you can't be there. Great, Brad. Yeah, same thing. Um, I currently have, like I said, oh, I didn't say this. I have 14 interns working for me right now. I'm in the process of hiring or want to hire an additional five within the next two weeks. Um, it's it's tremendous growth and, and really excited about that. Um, as it relates to work hours, honestly, you pick your hours so long as you make yourself available for those during business hours that are necessary. Um, very rarely do we have a lot of business hours that are like you have to attend those things. Most often what happens is you've got a project meeting once a week. Um, you could think of it like, you know, if you're using agile methodology, it's your stand up meeting that are, you know, we don't have daily stand ups. It's more of a weekly. Um, but it's, it's something along those lines where you're really asking the question, what did I do last week? What am I planning on doing this coming week? And what's help, what help is needed from either my project sponsor or from me as, as your direct line of support here, whatever that might look like. Um, does that answer your question, Jenny? I think I missed something else. Um, undergrads, grads, international students? Everything. Yeah, I like everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I will hire, I will, I, again, Laura mentioned it and it sounds bad, but really degree doesn't matter. You know, I, I could care less what your degree is so long as you've got the skills that I need you to have and are willing to learn because the majority of what we're going to do is not something that you're going to learn in class, or it is something you're going to learn in class, but it's more theoretical and we're actually going to learn by doing. Um, now, that doesn't mean you don't learn by doing in class. I don't mean to, to say that that doesn't happen. It absolutely does happen. But a large portion of what we do is, is learning through trial and error. It's, it's scrappy, it's hacky, um, and it's just trying to figure things out. And these are answer, questions that nobody has answers to yet, or at least nobody that we talk to or that's working on the problem has answers to yet. And so we're looking to you to help us solve those problems, to help us figure out answers that we haven't figured out yet. Great, thank you. And Craig. So I, I guess um, to answer your question, Jenny, I think one thing I have to talk about is why are we here as Motorola Solutions? And we're here, uh, we are here, our primary purpose here is to develop a talent pipeline. So our interest when we hire interns is to hire full-time employees. And that's actually how I get evaluated. How, how many students am I actually able to hire as interns and then convert to full-time employees? Right now, you know, our software businesses are just exploding and we cannot hire enough software engineers. So, um, so we definitely hire um, undergrads and, and graduate students. Um, and when it comes to international students, we definitely do hire international students, but it's a partnership because our, our goal, if we hire an international student, is to actually bring you on and then take you through the H-1B process. So right now, because of the way the immigration laws are, we have not been successful with undergrads going through the H-1B process, but we have been successful, very successful with master's students. So I have a number of master's students who are international that I've hired and been able to get through you know, the H-1B process. So if you're an undergrad and you intend to go for your master's degree, we're, we're certainly willing to partner with you and say, hey, that's great. And you know, let come work with us. And then when you finish your master's degree, um, we'll work with you on getting your H-1B visa and, and going through that way. Um, so I, I think for us, it's all about a partnership towards um, permanent employment. And uh, you know, we definitely hire are a lot of my students who are international, they work for me on CPT, and then after they graduate, they work on OPT while they're waiting to get their H-1B. So like, for example, I have one of my full-time employees here, and a number of the students I placed at different areas in Motorola, I was just looking at the chat and seeing the question, are on OPT now while we're taking them through the lottery process for their H-1B visa. 
All right, great. And you've all mentioned potential opportunities. How, what is the best way for students to reach out or apply for these positions? Laura, I know you mentioned Handshake. Um, the Research Park Job Board is always a good place, but is, is there a way, is, do you prefer direct contact or? Um, Craig? Either Handshake or direct oh. email is fine. Okay. And handshake is the best we for will me. share Handshake, okay. Um, I actually have stopped using Handshake because it I get too many applications on Handshake. <laughs> um, so direct application, just just direct reach out to me is is always better. Um, so I don't post jobs anymore. I usually start with referrals, and then if somebody is interested and they reach out to me and they can find my email that tells me they're scrappy enough to figure out how to find me, then that makes me more interested. All right, great. So and, I actually, yeah, to be fair, I, I do have a similar practice to, to Brad in that sense. So one kind of gold mine for all of you is that all of the companies are listed in the research park are listed on our tenant directory on the research park website. So it is interesting that there aren't more direct uh, emails that go out, but that is one way that we do encourage um, students to connect with the companies at the research park. The tenant directory has uh, further descriptions about the op different operations as well as contact information. So that is definitely one way that I encourage you to connect. And then these different types of events where you're going to get to hear from the employers directly. So as much as possible, we do try to connect and have the uh, company speak directly to you as the student. Um, it looks like we have another question uh, in the chat. Do you uh, have a hiring timeline yet for fall 2021? I mean, I'm always hiring on sort of an ongoing basis. So if you, know, you want to apply now, just cover your availability in your cover letter. I, to be honest, I tend to be slightly probably behind on hiring, so a little bit slower, um, kind of with Brad on, I could hire six people tomorrow, but it would take me three weeks to get them through my HR system. I, okay. I would say similar to Laura, I could hire five people tomorrow. Uh, thankfully, I have actually uh, bypassed my HR system <laughs> and we, we <laughs> use the University of Illinois uh, as a partner to be able to, you know, so employment happens through the University of Illinois. So um, for hiring timelines for the fall, really it's, an, it's a rolling basis, similar to Laura. Projects come and go. Um, they come more than they go. I actually haven't had any projects conclude yet. I've had more and more projects come my way and, and they're typically longer term roles. So I will be concluding, I did actually conclude a study uh, a couple of months ago. Um, but that one had started in October of 2019 and it concluded in December of 2020. So it was over a year long project that I had three different interns work on at different stages as project managers for it. Uh, so the majority of my hiring for fall 2021 looks like higher now uh, to through the duration of the summer and with the potential for extension as needed by the business or as desired by the student. Both are taken into consideration for extension into fall. Um, if there is any need that comes up for the fall, I probably won't know about it until late summer. So if there's a new need that's separate from what we're continually working on over the summer, I won't know until call it July. I also would right. throw in though that like when I hire students on, um, I do my best to like make it a partnership with the students. So, you know, I try to be open and communicative about the students about opportunities. I'm never out of stuff to do. Um, there's always more projects. And so, you know, as long as you are, I guess, entertained and enthused by the work you're doing at Axis, I will make it a point to make sure there is a you know, role for you, an internship for you um, at Axis. So, you know, if you're starting with me, say in summer, um, I will sort of work on the assumption as long as you're doing good work for me and you're enjoying the work you're doing, 
that you would want to continue with me in the fall, unless your academic schedule just really doesn't allow it. Um, I seek to retain interns. You guys just get better the longer you work for me. Um, I have one intern who has now worked for me for almost three years. She started with me as a freshman. Um, and I, I love having interns like that. Um, there's, it would, we'd be absolutely silly not to hire her after she graduates, so. I'll agree just chime 100%. in with, a, go ahead. Sorry, I just agree 100% with Laura. I'll just chime in with, a, I guess our, our, I actually changed the way we hire a while ago um, because as Laura said, I, our, our project needs are, I, I mean, the project demands are significantly higher than what I could ever actually service here at Research Park, even with the 40 some interns that we have now. And so I don't actually wait for the projects to arrive to hire. I know the disciplines, you know, generally half my projects are, are, com are computer science or in half are analytics. And so I, I generally hire that way. And then I go ahead and pick projects that I know fit the profile of and the interests of the people that we have. So as I said before, like we're all about a relationship towards full-time employment. So my first priority is to make sure the summer interns that wanna continue in the fall are the ones that get the first priority for fall hire. And then after that, I go ahead and, um, and augment based on kind of what I think my staffing profile should be. So I do try to do that. I do try to get the fall hires done before the summer. So my guess is in the next, you know, if you were asking for a timeline for fall, for fall hires, Sometime, you know, I'm going to be looking in the, in the career fairs that are coming up over the next in February and March to actually identify the students that would be good for fall that aren't currently on our staff. All right, great, thank you. Um, so I think we only have a few minutes left. So if anybody else does have questions, please feel to, free to post them. Um, we have a question for Brad. Do your interns use FPGAs in their work? I'm on mute. Um, so not currently, no. Um, so the majority of the work that we are doing is dealing with existing circuitry. And so we're not, I do have one intern who is working over the summer who's gonna be doing uh, um, He's going to be doing an interesting project in partnership with Verizon 5G that's also at the research park. Uh, but we don't do a ton of the sensor prototyping outside of the demands that the business comes to us with. So if you think about it, like what we're trying to do is build a BLE hub that can allow peripheral BLE communication and or other sorts of communication and then tap into a local Wi-Fi network to be able to transmit that data. So we, it's possible that we could get to the FPGAs, but we're not currently doing anything with them. All right, and are you all continue, still seeking interns for the summer? I know Brad, you said as immediately, yeah, Laura, immediately. Yes, well, yes, definitely. Still hiring for the summer, still hiring for spring. Um, you know, interested in, you know, flexibility in terms of where you'd want to start. And I've filled our research park facilities filled for the summer. So I've already filled, you know, we have usually run two large projects at the research park over the summer, but there's still our summer internship opportunities at other locations in Motorola. And I'm the face to the university for all recruiting. So um, yeah, there are there are um, summer internship positions, software for some people that have relevant software skills. And just one thing back to Brad's question, Brad's point before about major. I, I agree that you know we're the interesting thing. Computer science is pervasive right now, right? It's kind of like over. You know, you have the CS plus, you have CS in engineering. Um, but I but I th I guess for us, we were gonna want some. You know, we don't teach coding. We don't teach algorithm. We're, we're really not looking to teach some of the fundamentals. So we're expecting somebody, even if you're not, uh, you know, we're expecting somebody to have those fundamentals um, before they come to us. We don't expect you to know how to do machine learning algorithms, or and you might not know some of the uh, of how to do cloud computing and things like that. We'll gladly teach that. Um, but you know, if somebody is an English major and they've never taken a computer science class, we're not going to hire those people for software engineer positions. All right, yeah, I have I have five needs right now. Like Laura, I could hire for I'm still hiring for spring, 
I will also have about five needs for the summer as well, in addition to the five that I'm hiring for spring. All right. And actually, we have a great question. Are students required to be on campus for your internship? For, for mine, no. Um, AXIS, I guess, being in the uh, industry of risk management, we've taken a very uh, cautious back to office approach. Um, so none of our US offices have currently reopened. Personally, I am very tired of working from home and would love the opportunity to be allowed <laughs> back in my office. Um, but that's not the approach that AXIS has taken. But so no, my interns are not required to be back on campus. I do kind of ask that you, you know, as I think Craig and Brad both mentioned, you know, have some working hours during normal working hours um, so that you can interface with, you know, your colleagues and, you know, make sure that you're, you know, having those conversations that you need to have to keep projects moving. But no, I don't require anyone to be on campus. Go ahead, Craig. Oh, I, I, um, no, you're not required. Uh, you know, I encourage students, we have, as Brad said, we have very strict procedures. We've actually been in the office last summer and the fall and the spring at limited capacity with strict COVID protocols integrated in with the Safer Illinois app. We haven't had any cases of COVID exposure. Um, but, you know, it's really in this time, you have to be flexible, right? So it's really, if you're not comfortable with that situation, of course, you don't have to come in. Um, and if you're remote, if you're not even on campus, that's fine. I have a couple projects, maybe I have like two or three projects that require specific facilities that are in the office. So they have to be, for example, on an ethernet network that's required to be plugged in here, or they're using equipment that only, that is actually not possible to take out of the office. But otherwise, every project can be worked remotely. And we're really flexible on that. We'll work with you on that. Yeah, I think I have the, the strictest requirement of, of any of the three here. Um, I do require my students to be on campus over the summer. The majority of them are going to need to be in the office for some purpose, either physical manipulation of devices, uh, learning how to do other things. That's another big thing that I like to do is I, I hire students as an intern for one specific thing with the understanding and anticipation that they will learn all of the different roles within the office and will flex as needed. I hired earlier, I guess it was at the very beginning, I hired a student as a data science intern. She showed more prowess and more interest in project management. And so I transitioned her to a project management role. Um, but I do, I do need the students to be here at least part-time over the summer. Um, during, this, during the fall, especially during the spring of last year, um, I sent everybody home and I was managing the physical operations through the duration of the end of that. But during the summer, we had people coming in. We, and, and again, we're flexible like Craig. Um, if you don't feel comfortable, if you're not able to do things, you know, I do have one student who has severe forms of allergies and he is not comfortable coming into the office. Perfectly fine. We don't make him come into the office and we try to make accommodations as, as much as possible. Um, so really, and, and just like Craig, we have also had zero cases of COVID exposure, similar to the, you know, same operations as what Craig's doing, where we've got the same safe Illinois app and everything. So we're, Everything is, is safe and secure, but if you're not feeling comfortable, just have a conversation with me. I mean, this is, this is not the type of situation where like there, someone asked what skills are we expected to have? Open communication is probably the most important skill. Being willing to admit when you don't know something and being willing to say, hey, I don't feel comfortable or I don't like this or I think that that's wrong or I think that you're, that you're, you're saying things that don't make sense, Brad, like that's, that's the number one skill that I'm looking for is somebody who's willing to stand their ground and speak out if they feel uncomfortable or if they feel like they know more or if they feel like they have a better solution. Great. And you actually addressed the last question that I was going to ask of all the panelists. Um, but before we go into that, just uh, I think you have all seen a pattern here that Research Park offers the opportunity for a longevity in internships. So um, the the three year from freshman continuing in the same shop, um, I think that's an ideal situation for a lot of the companies. But 
Um, again, with hiring timelines and type of work, there's a lot of different opportunities available at Research Park. These are just a taste of three companies that are there. So I encourage you to check out the Research Park job board, um, come to our different events and just connect with the companies uh, because there's over 2,200 professionals that, are, uh, that work in the park, and professionals and interns, and they all have uh, a lot of experience that they can share. So there's a lot of value of um, having this resource available to you right here on campus. Um, and so, Brad, you had mentioned open communication being one of the biggest things. Laura had mentioned that as well. But as we wrap up here, I know we're out of time, but um, what what is this kind of like one piece of advice that you would offer or, you know, something that does make a student stand out to you? Laura? Oh, I don't want to go first. Um, <laughs> Um, I mean, I think the, the, that willingness to ask questions and to like start, sort of go a step further and uh, try to connect the dots. You know, you're not always going to be right the first time, but sort of agreeing with everything Brad said, you know, willing to stand your ground, know what you know, know what you don't know, and be willing to own, own that. Um, insurance is an industry, everyone going in didn't know what was going on pretty much. So, you know, you really have to face up to that. You're going to come in not knowing what's going on. There's a lot to learn. It's going to be overwhelming and that's going to be okay. Um, at the end of the day, there's, you'll, you'll get through that and we're going to make some interesting applications that are going to make people's work better. And at the end of the day, make society a better place. Um, and insurance really does help the world go around. Great, thanks. Craig? I'll, I'll make it quick. I, don't, I want to make sure I leave Brad some time to answer too. So I think on the positive side, when you're interviewing, I, I mean, if you come with a sense of passion, um, you know, and demonstrate that you have self-initiative, that's great. You know, make sure that on your resume, you have projects so that we can ask questions about the projects that you've done. I really want to gauge if you have a deep understanding and you weren't just a group member who didn't do anything, but you actually were, have a deep understanding. And I, and I want to, one quick aside, even if you've never had an internship before, you certainly have project experience. So instead of putting Taco Bell as your work experience, and I'm not knocking working at Taco Bell, but think of some things that you've done. You've done things in class and if and if you, hopefully you've done some things outside, those are great projects experiences to put in your resume that give us something to ask you about and to really probe in there. And then good team player. I mean, we are a very team oriented company. When you run Agile, it's team oriented. So you have to be able to work as teams. And I, I had a couple quick red flags um, when I interview people that I wrote down. If you come across as arrogant, um, if you have a go it alone mentality, I remember asking one student about how he liked working in teams and he said the only team he could be on was when he's the team leader and that immediately <laughs> disqualified him from working here. Um, you know, tardiness, if you're late to your interview, honestly, I don't know, even if you, you're going to have to have an incredible excuse if you're late. And I'm going to be really frank, cheating. I mean, if I give you a coding test and you cheat on it, um, you know, that's a, so, you know, that's really goes to integrity. So I think the whole issue of integrity being on time and being earnest and just, you know, giving an honest evaluation, you don't have to score hundred percent. I've had students that score zero percent on their coding test, but I watch the progression. I'm really interested in how you approach the problem rather than the result. And, you know, that, so don't be tempted to cheat on any of the aspects of the interview. Yeah, I agree with everything that Craig and Laura said. Uh, the one thing that I would add, or two things that I would add, I think an ex a sense of extreme ownership, and Craig touched on this, and I think Laura did as well, but this concept of extreme ownership, meaning if I give you an assignment, if I give you a task, I expect you to feel as if this is the most important thing in your life. Now, knowing that school is number one, always and always, I will, I will never work, I will never force work to conflict with school. And I will consistently tell this to each of my interns, like, if I'm giving you a task that is conflicting with school, you need to tell me that so that I'm not imposing on school because school is number one. But as it relates to work, I need you to take an sense of extreme ownership over the project or the work that it is that you're doing. Because again, if it doesn't happen, and, so, and a project owner, for example, comes to me and says, hey, I don't see so and so 
living up to this idea of extreme ownership, I will need to let that individual go and do the work myself. Because if it doesn't happen in my office, that's my fault. And I do hold that sense of extreme ownership to myself as well. Uh, the other thing that I would uh, I, I would say is, is really critical to all of this is, again, to Craig's point, integrity. We are a family. And if you haven't told me something that could impact your work and your work is suffering, and I don't know that, I need you to let me know. Like, I, I, can't, I can't make accommodations if I don't know about those things. And I do care about the people that work for me. You know, we have what we call a leadership council. And this is made up, made up of interns, but this leadership council we, meets on a weekly basis. And their number one question is, how is so-and-so doing? And we talk about every single intern in the office, intern, and ask, how are they doing? Not at work, not the tasks that they've been assigned, but how are they personally doing? And we address any problems, any concerns, and ask, how can we better serve those individuals? So this idea of servant leadership, I expect that from every single one of my students as well. All right, great. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us and taking the time. Um, Erhan? Thank you very much for joining us and uh, telling us what a great resource we have in the campus. Uh, thank you very much, all three of you. And Jenny, you too. Of course. Thanks, everyone. And uh, please check out those resources and connect with Research Park. Okay, so the symposium will continue. You guys are always welcome to watch our uh, seminars as well. Uh, Jenny, as well as uh, Craig, Laura, and Brad. So thank you very much. So let's meet next week at the same time. And thanks, Kat, for organizing all this. Bye-bye, everyone.